Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining me here for this uh, presentation on a Saturday morning. <clears throat> it's the, I think, the 30th Code Camp ever, which is pretty unbelievable. I think I've been at all but one or maybe two of those, which is pretty good. And I've spoken at a big majority of them as well. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, it's great to be here with you guys this morning. Let me get into my presentation here. Let me start this. Um, I'll do that and then I'll share my desktop. And sorry, I'm just setting up my computer a little bit here because it always puts it on the wrong screen for me for some reason. Let's get this over here. Okay. So, good morning. Uh, hi, Meg. I see you there in the middle. <laughs> well, at least it's the middle for mine. How are you? So, let me get started with this presentation. We're talking about solid principles of software design. And uh, a little bit about me, if you don't know who I am, it's good to start out with that yeah, background there. I am Andy Schwamm. On your screen, Andy. <laughs> What's that? We're all seeing uh, Meg on your screen. I don't know if Meg can close that down or... You're seeing Meg on my screen. Yes. There you go. How are you seeing Meg on my screen? We're good. We're good now. OK, that's weird. To... Oh, OK, thanks. I, I don't know how that happened. Um, are you seeing my slides? Yes. Yes. OK, now great. I am. Yes. OK, well, good. Just want to make sure. Um, so uh, my name is Andy Schwamm. I'm in uh, my, for a job. My title is AVP of uh, Application Development. I work at an insurance company in the Philadelphia area. I'm a 10-time Microsoft MVP for developer technologies, and I'm also a conference organizer. I organize, uh, help organize a conference called TechBash. You can check it out at techbash.com, and it's a four-day conference that we hold up in the Poconos um, every year, except last year, of course, and hopefully this year we'll be having it. So check out techbash.com if you're interested in that kind of thing. If you want to get hold of me or find some information, uh, you can find me on Twitter at Schwami. Uh, my GitHub account is also Schwami, and the samples today will be on my GitHub, uh, so you can go check that out. Um, if you want to see me on LinkedIn, I'm at Andrew Schwam, and I have a blog, schwamisays.net. And these are different ways you can find me and find some of the content and things like that that I'll be sharing. Uh, a little quick plug for the Dev Talk Show, which is a show that I host along with Chris Gomez and Rich Ross. We run this show Wednesday nights at 8.30 p.m. We're on Twitch and YouTube. And uh, we're, we're basically Wednesday nights at 8.30 p.m. So, you know, if you go into those Philly.net meetings, you can basically just, you know, take a little break and then flip over to our show and keep the conversation going. We talk about all kinds of things from software development, you know, whether it's languages, C Sharp, uh, we talk about .NET and Azure and DevOps, but really anything that pertains to software developers, we're interested in talking about. The show is a combination of presentations types uh, content, just overall conversation. We have some shows that have no slides and no, uh, no code at all. We actually did an entire series on these solid principles. I wanted to point that out. Today, we're going to be doing a speed round here. This is a one hour talk on five solid principles. We actually did a whole series of them. And if you go to our archives on youtube.com slash the dev talk show, you can actually see uh, an hour of content on each one of these principles. Well, I think it's actually four hours total. We doubled two of them up into one show, but um, you know, lots more discussion, lots more examples and, and conversation about those. So uh, I hope you'll check that out if you, if you have some time. And with that, let's, let's get into this. So today, again, we're talking about solid principles and we're, this is pretty much a lightning round here with five principles in 55 minutes to cover here. So I thought it would make sense to think about what I think is the key takeaway. Um, the key takeaway is not necessarily the five, each of the five principles. I think, I think the key takeaway, and I, I'm saying this as an architect and as a, as a manager and, you know, as a leader of software developers, I think it's most important for people to understand the value of good design principles, right? If you embrace that, if you, if you buy into the value, then, and, and your team buys in, right? It's really important that the whole team gets this and understands this. If everyone buys into it, then 
the principles come easier, right? And the way that you might implement these principles comes easier. I'll show examples of all these things and I'll talk about them, but getting it, getting the value of it is probably the most important part. And I hope that makes sense. Um, by the way, if you do have questions, I believe you can uh, unmute yourself. I'm gonna go pretty quickly here and we might need to hold some questions till the end. But if you do have a question, let me know. I'm gonna try to keep an eye on the chat, but um, that's gonna be hard because it's on a different monitor. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. So, oh, and that did not change, there we go. Okay, so let's talk about why we need design principles because I'm already saying this is part of the most important part of this. Um, why? Well, building software is hard. Let's let's face it. This is this is this is tough. This is our jobs, right? But maintaining and changing poorly designed software is really costly. And when I say costly, sure, I'm talking about money, but I'm also talking about time, talking about missed opportunities, I'm talking about frustration, I'm talking about all these different things that um, that are problematic. You know that we don't we don't want to have, right? And and if the code is designed poorly, we really get into problems. We get into, you know, wasted time and things like that. And fragile code leads to bugs. You know, we, we just, and it's, it's just disappointing, right? Like we don't want to spend our time, our day doing that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's really important to get like good design principles in on day one, right? And think about that from the beginning, because once you start writing the code, it gets harder to change as well. It's never too late. Don't get me wrong. It's never too late to put in good design principles, but um, but uh, you know you want to do that. I'm seeing in the comments it says, "Could you share full screen?" And I think that was fixed. I guess maybe that was. I'm not sure. Is that is that fixed? Anybody could let me know. Looks good today. So it's a, yeah. Yeah, I'm in spotlight mode now. Okay, I guess maybe that wasn't set up in the beginning. I don't know. Um, <laughs> thanks. So. Let's, uh, so anyway, that's, you know, why this, why design principles are important. Design principles are sort of proven success uh, concepts that people have found that say, you know, if we follow these principles, if you follow these ideas and these guidelines, your code will be easier to deal with. Now, why do we want to follow these particular guide, uh, these particular guidelines, these solid principles? Well, you really want to think about what problem are you trying to solve? Right. If you're not trying to solve the same problem I am, then these design principles might not be the best thing for you. And that's OK. Right. What you don't want to do is follow design principles because, well, I don't know. I went to code camp and Andy said it was a good idea. So I'm going to just kind of follow that. Or I read a blog post and someone said I should do something. You really want to think about what problem are we trying to solve? Right. So here's the problem that I've set up right? that, that I find with my years of experience in software. This is the biggest problem, right? That code is often hard to maintain and uh, it's fragile and it's hard to test and like all these kind of things. And that's not what I want. What I want is code that is less error prone, that is easier to maintain, easier to read, less breakable, more reusable, more decoupled. I find that that is the key to success for me because what happens is we build software and then later, People come along and say, well, I need you to add things to the software. Or I need you to modify it, right? And that's where the a lot of the trouble kicks in. So this is what I'm after, right? And I think the solid principles help to solve this problem. Design principles are not implementations, right? They don't dictate how you solve and, you know, sort of implement the principle. The principle is an idea. It's a concept, right? And uh, design principles are not patterns. Patterns are often used to implement the principles and that's great right i'll show some of them today but the principles are not specific about how you achieve the goal right and as i said the best way to demonstrate them is with examples and i'm going to show you some techniques and some implementations but that doesn't mean you have to do it the way i'm doing it right there's you, you can solve these things lots of different ways and so now let's get into the solid principles and the solid principles uh were put together by robert martin uh, he did not create the principles, really. He just sort of put them together into a nice package called Solid. And he packaged them as a sort of a group because they sort of solve similar problem, which is what he said is poor dependency management leads to code that is hard to change, fragile, and non-reusable. On the other hand, when dependencies are well managed, 
the code remains flexible, robust, and reusable. Now that's what we want. We want code that is flexible, robust, and reusable. And by the way, when we talk about dependencies, let's just clear that definition up really quickly. That a dependency is really just something that your code relies on, right? Often it's other code. A dependency might be a different class. It might be a library that you're importing uh, and you're calling and, and, uh, and you know, creating uh, objects and calling methods on them. It might be a service that you use. That's what a dependency is really. I mean, the database is a dependency and the connections to the database, all that stuff is, is dependencies. So we wanna manage our dependencies well. And in most cases, Today, we'll be talking about dependencies that are actually pieces of code. And with that, let's get into the single responsibility principle, which is, um, I think, you know, one of the best, honestly, I mean, I don't know if, you, if we're going to rate them or grade them, but it's really one of the best. It's one of the easiest, I think, to sort of grasp the concept, but that doesn't mean it's it's uh, always easy to, to um, find the sort of sweet spot of how you want to deal with single responsibility principle. But Anyway, the single responsibility principle, uh, excuse me, the single responsibility principle states that a class should have one and only one reason to change. So let that sink in for a minute. A class should have one and only one reason to change. Now, I think many people think that the single responsibility principle states that a method should do one thing. And OK, that's not really a bad place to start. But it doesn't give you the full scope of the thing. And so First of all, it says a class should have one and only one reason to change, not a method, a class. Um, and what does that mean, only one reason to change? How is that different from only do one thing? And so, you know, with these principles, you often find there's a gray area of how far do I want to take these things, the single responsibility principle, how single do I really want to be? And if you consider that part about one reason to change, it helps a lot. It really helps to when you when you want to you know, get things done here. And so one reason to change might be, you know, who in the, you know, as a software engineer, we report, at least in my company, we report to a lot of different departments, right? So, and lots of different teams. And you shouldn't have code that like maybe more than one person might ask you to change, right? That's, that's a good sort of way of looking at it. And I'll show an example of what that means. Um, but by following the single responsibility principle, we will get code that is easier to test easier to read, easier to maintain. Again, the code really only does one thing, right? It only has one reason to change. So by nature, then you get less side effects. You immediately follow separation of concerns. Separation of concerns, if you're familiar with that concept, which is another uh, design principle, uh, says that you, you, know, you don't want to mix and match your UI logic with your business logic, for example. Uh, well, if your code only does one thing, then you're, you're sort of inherently doing that, right? So let's get into a sample because samples are really the best way to understand these things. And uh, where am I here? Let's go to VS Code. And this is my, uh, th these uh, samples are on my Git repo on GitHub, which is uh, Schwami is my uh, Git uh, profile and you can find me there. So I would say the best way to understand these things is to look at examples of things that are not following the, the principle. And so if we take a look at this, we have this class here called not single responsibility. So don't worry about the name of the class, but I've got a method and this method may look familiar to you from code you've written. I've certainly written code like this over uh, my years of experience. I don't want you guys to think that uh, I don't, I don't, um, you know, we're all learning. We're all trying to get better at this stuff. And there was a time when I would have written code that looked a lot like this. So let's say I have a method where I want to have members join my website. So I have a method that takes a username and a password, right? Pretty standard stuff. And then what do I do? The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to validate the username. Now, of course, you can see if you look closely here, this validation is a little silly, but it's just to prove a point that we would have certain validation. We want to make sure the username meets certain requirements. Maybe we're going to check that it's an email. This little, oh, it has an ad symbol. It must be an email. I hope you would do better in your code, but this is just a demo. And I'm just trying to show that I would have a bunch of rules in here um and is the screen fuzzy people are saying the screen is fuzzy um i don't is it fuzzy to everyone uh let me know if it's fuzzy i'm going to keep going and i'm going to keep an eye on the chat looks okay. sorry meg looks it, okay okay looks someone good. might just have bad bad bandwidth on their side possibly sorry about that um 
So uh, then the next validation rule might be to make sure we have a valid password. Now, clearly, your security folks aren't going to agree with your password uh, strictness here when we just want to make sure that a password is five characters or more, but that's okay. I've got some validation stuff. Then I want to check to make sure that the member doesn't already exist, a duplicate username, so I'll do that. Then I'll come along and there'll be some code that really adds this thing to the database. I've represented it here with this simple method call called add user, but really we're just you know creating the user. And then, well, we want to send them a welcome message. Hey, thanks for joining, right? So here's a welcome message. I create the subject and the body and the text, and I create this mail message, and then I use this SMTP client to send it. And I think it's really obvious from this example, even though it's not super complicated code, it's only, uh, you know, what is it? Probably 30 lines of code there, something like that, maybe less. Um, but it clearly does more than one thing. I think everyone can see that. Now, it's all scoped in the same way. It's all related, sure. It's all related to joining the website, but it does more than one thing. But let's go back to that idea of a coach. Uh, code should only have one reason to change. So I've got this class here. I've got this method, and the marketing department comes along. The marketing department comes along and says, hey, Andy, this message you have here, this is kind of weak. I think we can do better than that. Thanks for joining is probably not just what we want to have. We want to add some HTML, some, you know, some styling and things like that. So I've got a reason to change that has nothing to do with the validation of the, the validation logic. Right. I might also have another team come along and say, well, Andy, we need to increase these password security <clears throat> guidelines. So I need you to change that. So now I have two reasons to change. Clearly, I could identify more in here, but I've got two reasons to change. And what happens is if I go in to change this welcome message, I do run the risk of breaking this validation logic. Now, in this case, let's face it, if we're being realistic, I think it's pretty safe to say that might not happen, right? I probably can separate those two things out, but I don't know what happens when I'm in the code. Once I open up a file, anything can happen is the way I look at it. Uh, another thing is that now I might need to rethink my unit tests and everything like that. And, um, you know, I just have like lots of problems that could possibly go on. So this is not single responsibility. Now let's take a look at an example that is single responsibility. Uh, what I've got here is uh, some classes here, like a membership validator. And now I've got these classes in one file. That's for the purposes of this demo, because it's easier to just scroll and show you those. But these would, I, of course, be in different files, possibly even in different projects and, and compiled into different DLLs if need be. So I've got the membership validator and it calls validate user. And of course, what I would all really do is take this code Right, this isn't really complex. I would take this maybe code and maybe just paste it into here, right? Um, so it's the same code possibly, right? It would be a little different because I've got username. Uh, no, actually in this case, I think it actually works. Um, but you know, it might need to change a little bit, but the idea is that we're not really adding more code, we're separating it out. So I've got this membership validator. I've got this membership service that pretends to maybe save it to a database or wherever your storage is. I've got a message formatter and it's its own class and it has a format message method that you know sets the subject and the body and I've got the notifier class and maybe in its method it uses SMTP mail or something like that. And so we've separated out these things into their own classes. These are single responsibility. They each do one thing and it's really clear what they do, right? It's easy to read this code. It's easy to understand it. It's easy to follow it. It's easy to maintain it. Now, you may be wondering, well, that's great. You've got all these different methods, but we need to get them all together. They all have to get used together. And so we need to have this other method. In this case, it's in a class called single responsibility, which would probably not be what it's called. Maybe it would be called the membership service or something like that. And we have the join method. And then what I do is I'm calling each of the single responsibility uh, classes themselves and executing those methods together. And I think people struggle with this a little bit because you think, well, that's not single responsibility. That is doing all these different things. And I look at it as, um, I look at it as the single responsibility of this class or this method in particular is to orchestrate, to say, hey, I need to do 
this and then this and then this and then this. And there might be logic in here that says, you know, uh, if validation failed, you know, this is pseudocode here, if validation failed, then do something here. That's the kind of stuff that would belong in this kind of code, right? It controls the flow, the process of the application, right? And I often call these orchestrators. I actually name them orchestrator. I might call this the membership orchestrator so that we're clear on what it does. Its job is to orchestrate. So that's single responsibility principle from an example. I do think uh, in this case, I'm going to show a couple other quick examples and um, of why, because I think the single responsibility principle has this gray area of like, well, how far do we want to go with single responsibility? And so let's imagine we have an object or, you know, some sort of entity called a customer and we have a customer service and its job is to maybe manage, you know, things we do with customers. OK, so I have a method in here called get customer and another method called add customer. Of course, I haven't implemented these, you know, sorry to, you know, throw that in there. This is just a, a placeholder there. So I've got get customer and add customer and remove customer and update customer. And you might say, well, those are four different things. That's not really the single responsibility principle. And you'd be right. That really isn't right. To be fair, we'd probably want something called the get customer service and the add customer service and the remove customer service. But I find that that's not exactly practical and that kind of gets in the way. And most people would agree. Most people I've spoken to, you, you could go so far as to have every method in its own class. But the scope of those methods is pretty similar, right? These things are all really related to each other. And you could say that the single responsibility of that customer service is to provide a, um, you know, sort of an API for working with customers or something like that, right? And getting customer data in and out of whatever system we're building. And that's okay, uh, I think, as long as they're scoped quick closely, we wouldn't find that they probably all call the same repository and all use similar dependencies and things like that. But there's more methods in this class down here, I have one called add to shopping cart, and you can see it takes a product and it works with a customer. So I'm adding it to the customer's shopping cart. So you might say, well, that feels a little different, but it's close, right? Maybe. And then I've got these other methods like, and I made these up for the example here, calculate customer tax records, get customer feedback, get customers by location, get customers by product group, rank customers by feedback, rank customers by product, rank customers by region. Now we're starting to say, this does not feel like single responsibility. Matter of fact, the ranking might be, uh, we have an analysis team that wants to do ranking and things like that. We might have a search team that has a search page that uh, wants to get customers by different ways. And we start to look quickly and say, well, these don't sound like they're all uh, sort of having the same responsibility. And so what I might want to do is take, let's say these out, right? And I could put them in a class called um, public class uh, ranking service, something like that, um, you know, and maybe I would put these into there and I could split this up and maybe I leave these four top ones as the only ones in the customer service. Uh, again, I'm not going to keep going with that because it would be more the same, but I want you guys to see that it's sometimes and it's up to you and it's up to your team to come up with some guidelines and some sort of limits to what you're going to do, but it's okay to have more than one method in the same class, at least in my humble opinion. I also want to show another example um, where I have this sort of converter class, right? And I've got a customer and I want to con convert a customer into a customer DTO. That's something we do a lot, at least in my organization, where we're maybe you're going to pass that data back out to another service and we turn it into a DTO. So in that method, I might just copy the properties from one to the other and return the new object. And I might also have a method called take a customer, uh, sorry, take a DTO and turn it into a customer. And in my, in my world, uh, in my Bob Ross kind of world, in my happy little world, uh, it's okay for these two things to work and live together in perfect harmony. You know, it's, um, I think that's okay. But then you come down here and you see, well, wait, I'm also going to take strings A, B, and C and turn them into an employee. You know, one of these things is not like the other. One of these things doesn't belong here. And I would obviously take that out. And probably 
I would name this thing better. And when you name things appropriately, it really solves this problem. If in the beginning I said, I want to convert customers and I call this thing the customer converter, it would have been pretty clear to me and other developers and they would not have put this in there because this isn't even a customer at all. It's like, it's pretty clear. So, um, so that's a little bit, uh, another example of the uh, single responsibility principle. And I hope that makes sense to everybody. We're going to move on to the next principle, which is the open closed principle. The open closed principle states that software entities, and again, these are not written for C sharp specifically, even though my examples are in C sharp, software entities, which could be classes, modules, functions, methods, whatever it is that you're doing. Software entities should be open for extension, but closed for modification. Okay, let that sink in for a minute. Software entities should be open for extension, but closed for modification. All right, so what we're saying here is, well, we know we're gonna have to enhance our application. We're gonna have to make changes to it, tweak it, add features, but we don't wanna open up the class. We don't wanna open it up and start changing it because we run the risk of breaking it once we do that, right? We want it to be extendable, right? We want it to be, uh, where we can make changes to it without having to get in there. Right now, I can think of an example that's not really the open closed principle, but let's just think about this because you might be doing something similar already. Think about how it relates to other things we do, such as connection strings. You might have a class that has your data access logic in it, and hopefully you don't hard code in the connection string. You would take that connection string and put it in a config file. And then you would refer to that config file in the in your class, right? And you've sort of moved that dependency on that connection string out to a different place, out to the config file, where it's easy to change and maintain. Now, I wouldn't quite call that uh, extendable, right? But it is making it more maintainable. I can change where I connect to simply without changing the code. Let's take a look at a real sort of uh, example that's a bit more uh, software based. Right, and let's take a look at the file here called not open closed. And let's take a look at that logic we had earlier, which is that validating a user method. And we have all our silly logic in here that we're gonna use to validate. And then the, uh, you know, some people come along and say, well, you know, this password security thing or this password uh, uh, strength validation, this is pretty weak. I think we can do better than that. We want to make sure that you have at least a special character and maybe you have to use uppercase and lowercase numbers, uh, lowercase letters. So we want to change this. And so what does that mean? Well, that means I need to come into this class and I need to change this code right here. I need to change this code. When I change this code, I'm now running the risk of breaking it. I'm running the risk of screwing up my unit tests. I'm running the risk of, you know, did I come in here and make a mistake? Did I by mistake actually, you know, whoops, oh, I deleted something, you know, that I could do. I could mess up the flow. Again, this is a pretty simple example, but you can imagine that if I came in here to add some other if statements, I might break the flow of the logic and I might screw it up. This is not very open. So let's take a look at an open example of the membership validator. And in this case, I have my membership validator called open membership validator. And I've got a validate user method, the same sort of signature. It does the same thing, takes the account and it validates it. But in this case, I'm going to loop through a list of rules. And when I loop through each rule, I run the validate method on it, right? And now I can add and remove rules as often as I like without having to go in and change this class. This is tested. This class works already. And I'm not going to break additional rules because each rule doesn't have to change. I only add new rules or remove rules when I want to or change a particular rule. Now, how do the rules work? Well, in this case, and this is just an example. Remember, I said there's not only one way to implement uh, and to follow a certain principle. I'm just showing you a way that I might solve this problem. And so what I might do is I might have this open membership validators constructor accept a list of rules and then I can operate on them. And the rules are so simple. They're not longer, really. It's, I'm not really changing the code that's in the rule. I'm wrapping it in a little bit. Yeah, certainly I'm adding a few lines of code, but this isn't complicated code, right? And so I'm simplifying things by having each validate method do one thing. And in this case, they're throwing exceptions. I mean, of course, that's uh, this is not the way I would really write this method. Uh, I wouldn't really use exceptions in this way. I'm not advocating that. 
But I can add now as many rules as I want. These rules can be split up into different DLLs. I can, I can drop in like a DLL and get more rules if I want to. Uh, there's so many ways I could deal with this. Now, I want to be clear here because we talked about not being dogmatic a little bit and that, you know, we want to find ways as a team to agree upon how we want to follow these, um, these guiding principles, these uh, solid principles. And to be fair, if I was writing this validate user method, well, first of all, hopefully my validation logic would be a little better than that, right? Let, let's not, we're not talking about that, but I probably would write the method like this. I probably would have some of the validation logic in here together. Why? You know, it's really not that complicated, uh, but it might get complicated. If this was it, if all I was doing was validating a, a you know, an email address and a, and, a use, and, a, and a password, I might keep it together. I'm not saying you should. I'm not saying that we shouldn't. Um, yeah, let's pretend my code is good. Thanks, Meg. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I like to pretend my code is good here. Um, so uh, that's a chat comment. If I don't know if the chat will be visible when people replay these, but um, just getting comments in there a little bit. So um, what I was saying is, you know, you have to be reasonable and you have to, you know, my job is to ship, make sure code ships. So possibly in this case, breaking this out into these different validators might not be the way I do this. I might say, no, this is acceptable. It really depends on how complicated this is getting or thinking about the future, how complicated it might get. I work in the insurance business. We have to validate, let's say, insurance policies, right? Insurance policies have many, many properties to them, many fields, lots of rules. This is something I would do, maybe not exactly like this, but with some kind of validate policy thing, I would have like a rules engine here. You could call it that. I would turn it into something like that, but you don't have to. It's up to you guys to think about what is the best way to uh, follow these design principles. Uh, let's take a look at the next principle now. And again, I'm moving along pretty quickly and I hope you guys are following. Um, if you do have questions and you think I can handle them, we'll, we'll jump in and take those questions along the way. Um, the Liskov substitution principle, we're up to the L, S-O-L-I-D, Liskov substitution principle. If you're wondering where the name comes from, Liskov substitution principle was identified by Barbara Liskov, and that's where it gets its name from. And the Liskov uh, substitution principle states, functions that use pointers or references to base classes must be able to use objects of derived classes without knowing it. Yeah. Sure, of course, right? Okay, let's let this sink in for a minute here. Because, you know, the way they're written sometimes is like, wow. Functions that use pointers or references to base classes must be able to use objects of derived classes without knowing it, okay? So if I have a class and I have a method, and if that method accepts an object as a parameter, it should be able to accept derived objects, not just the base object, but derived objects. Derived objects should have the same behavior as the class they're derived from, right? Now, when we think about the way we learned object-oriented programming, we didn't exactly learn it right, as far as I'm concerned, for this principle. And let me take you back to the way I learned object-oriented programming and the way I actually taught it. I, I taught Java uh, for a, I worked for a consulting company, and as we brought on new developers, I did some training and I taught Java many years ago before I was a .NET developer. I think it was before .NET existed, as a matter of fact. Um, and we used to teach people how to do inheritance. And we would start with the, um, we would start with the idea of a bank account. That was always the example. And we'd say, well, create a class called a bank account. And if you want to create a checking account, you would uh, inherit from a bank account. And if you wanted to create a checking account or a savings account, both of those would inherit from a bank account. And we used to teach people the is a relationship, right? A checking account is a bank account. A savings account is a bank account. Ta-da, you've got, uh, you know, an inheritance model. And um, what we find as we get further into software development is that that is a relationship isn't really correct, at least not in my opinion, right? And so I think you wanna use the is substitutable for relationship. A checking account is substitutable for a bank account. It may be, it may not be, right? I don't know your business rules in this case, but 
not just being it, because sure, it is a bank account, but is it substitutable for a bank account? Let's show an example here. And if we look at Liskov's substitution file here, we'll see this is the classic example of Liskov. I mean, this is really the one you see pretty much everywhere. Uh, I, I can't claim any greatness in, in finding this example here. Uh, we've got a rectangle. A rectangle has two properties, has height and width, right? Okay, great. It probably has some other methods to like, uh, you know, calculate area and things like that, but we're going to keep it simple. And so, well, we want to come along and we want to, someone says, you know what we also need? We need a square, right? And so what do we do? Well, if I'm a uh, fan of geometry, I would say, well, a square is a rectangle. Yes, it is. A square is a rectangle. And so I would say, well, why don't I inherit from rectangle? And now I've got that. This is great. My square is done. Everything is good. The problem is if you come down to some code where you use this, and I might want to pass a square into the same method that takes a rectangle. And so what do they do? You know, we've got this square. And the first thing we do is we say, well, let's set the height and let's set the width. And if anybody's paying attention here in class, and I hope some of you are, you might recognize that, well, that's not really a square. That is a rectangle because I've set the height and width differently. So a square isn't really substitutable for a rectangle, at least not in, in my circumstances here. Now, you could get into, you know, some hacks to solve this. You could override the height and the width properties in the square and say, well, I'm going to set one when we set the other. But that's really sort of sets up other problems and other chances for failure. You know, there's the, you don't want to start getting into hacks. What you really want to do is say, quite frankly, a square is not a rectangle. They might both be shapes, right? I might have a public class shape um, and, and inherit from that. Uh, there's a lot of ways you could solve for this. Now, I'm not going to really get it too far into this. Uh, you know, the example of how to solve this is don't do this. Um, just be careful when you uh, build your inheritance models and don't derive from uh, classes that you really aren't substitutable for. That's sort of the Liskov substitution principle. If I'm being honest, this one doesn't really come up that often in my uh, programming. I mean, I guess I keep it in mind all the time, but um, I don't I don't know. I don't think it's as hard to solve for as some of the others. That, again, that's personal opinion. Um, so let's move on to the next one. What are we doing on time? We're getting there. Interface segregation principle. We've got two left. The interface segregation principle states that clients should not be forced to depend on interfaces that they don't use. Clients should not be forced to depend upon interfaces that they don't use. You don't want to build really big interfaces. When you build a large interface, someone that wants to implement that interface has to implement every method in the interface, right? And that's sort of a problem, right? It's a problem for other people, and you really want to make it easier for them and for yourself. Uh, it sort of limits you in your ability to use interfaces, which are a really great tool. Let's go into an example of interface segregation, and we'll look here at the interface segregation principle. And so let's say I want to build this interface called iRepository, right? And, and an interface really becomes a contract for something we're going to do. And so I create my iRepository, and as you can tell from the name, this is some interface that's going to help us with data access, right? We might be using the repository pattern or we might not be, that doesn't really matter. But a repository that's gonna get data in and out of a data source, and it's gonna have certain methods. It's gonna have a find method to get something by its ID, the get method, maybe does some kind of search, add, update, delete of my objects, my classes, my entities, whatever you're calling them, that's kind of a standard repository. You think, well, that's pretty good. I've got this, and I can then take classes that implement iRepository and pass them on and do different things with them, and they all work and behave the same way. And life is good. Until someone comes along to me later and says, hey, Andy, you set up this iRepository, and we love using it, but we've got this, uh, we've got this class, this object, this structure, that uh, its ID is a GUID. Maybe it was because we're using an existing database table or something like that, and the database is set up that way. Or maybe there's some reason we can't use an integer. And we're like, well, now we're kind of stuck. We like all these other things, but this isn't working for us. Um, and um, and uh, or another example would be, um, 
sorry, I think I got off track there a little bit. I don't know. My, uh, we might say that um, we uh, we have some data that is, I, I actually just jumped to the totally wrong example in my mind. That was classic. So, uh, you know, we might say that the developers come along and say, uh, this is great, but we've got uh, we've got some read only data. I'm sorry, <laughs> that's morning for me. Uh, we might have some data that is read only, and I don't, I can't implement add and update and delete because that is not what the business supports. We don't need all these methods. We only need the find and the get method. We don't need add, update, or delete. And my impl- my interface isn't working. You know, it doesn't work for them anymore. So what I could do, or what I should have done from the beginning, is create this thing called an I read only repository. And in the I read only repository we find the methods like find and get, right? And that's great, now they can use that. Now, we also still need the writable one, so how do I wanna do that? Well, I might make, uh, I might do this, I might make an I writable repository and put the add and the update and delete in there. So now I've got interface segregation. I've split out the read from the write. Now, I might have a repository that implements these uh, repository uh, interfaces and I could, just simply, you know, great thing about C Sharp is you have multiple interface implementation here, right? I can I can have multiple interfaces here on this sort of inheritance uh, and model there. Uh, another way I could do it is I could say, oops, sorry, I could say that the I writable one actually implements I read only because there's a good chance if you're going to write, you're also going to read, and then I could take this away. Uh, there's more than one way to solve the problem. You could do it any way you want. But the point is, I want to make finely grained interfaces. I might even take delete away. I've done things where I have a delete repo, uh, uh, I deletable repo, because sometimes we don't allow deleting. We might have a soft delete. Well, that could be solved through the implementation, but there's different ways you could do this. So this is interface segregation. I've split this thing apart and I've made it into two different interfaces. Uh, This is the example, I I don't know what I was doing, my brain jumped into this example when I was explaining that one earlier about this iEntity interface. And I might have an interface that says, hey, you know, all of our objects have an integer ID, right? And we always have these fields in here in our objects. This is like a, you know, more of a traditional class than than a service of some kind. And we have things like created date, created by user. I call these audit fields. I don't know if you guys put these kind of things, but a lot of times we have these things on tables and this could be, you know, whatever it is that you need it to be. And we've just sort of decided that like our entities are, are, are things that we're going to store in the database need to follow this pattern. They need to have an integer ID and all these other fields. And then of course, and this is what I was starting to say before, someone comes along and says, yeah, but uh, we have a GUID. We have an ID that's a GUID. This isn't really working out great for us. And now we're limited. I, we love using all these created dates and created by things, but we can't use this interface. So what we do, again, we split it out. We say, I want to have the iInt ID as, an, uh, as its own interface. And you might call this something different. You might call it has int ID. That's fine, right? Whatever your naming uh, structure is, strategy. And I might move those things into this I auditable. And I actually like the name of that, right? And then I have my class here, my something class, which implements iIntID and iAuditable. And that's great. Something, my something has an int ID, but something else down here has a GUID. And so it only implements iAuditable. And so you can see how we separate these things and it makes it easier for us in the future. That's pretty much the interface segregation principle. Um, I kind of think of it almost as like, be kind to your neighbor principle, right? Or be kind to the people that will follow uh, and be kind to yourself. And you find that by doing this, it really just makes things easier for you in the future. Okay, we're down to the D, the solid. We're at D, which is the dependency inversion principle. The dependency inversion principle is all about writing loosely coupled software. And it says, And this is another one that's like fun to read, right? High level modules should not depend on low level modules. Both should depend on abstractions. High level modules should not depend on low level modules. Both should depend on abstractions. And abstractions should not depend on details. Details should depend on abstractions. Wow, what are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about abstractions, right? That's the key word in here, I think, right? And a high-level module might be like a service that needs to consume 
a uh, another uh, dependency, right? And so the dependency should be based on the abstraction, and the high-level class calling it, let's say the service, should also depend on the abstraction, right? The abstraction's in the middle. I'll show a picture that really explains it. But we want to think about putting the abstraction in the middle, and don't tie yourself to a concrete implementation. Before I go any further, I want to just mention something because there's a lot of confusion about the dependency inversion principle. And many people say, oh, the D stands for dependency injection, which is not correct. Dependency inversion and dependency injection are two different things. They actually work together pretty well. And I'll show that at the end just to tie it all together because I do think that people sort of think of dependency inversion as dependency injection, but it is not. Dependency injection is helpful with dependency inversion. And I keep saying these words and I keep confusing you by saying dependency inversion, dependency injection, blah, 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 right? <laughs> that's why people confuse it. But we're talking about the dependency inversion principle. We're inverting the dependencies. Let's take a look at what this means. So in the slide here, we can see that in the center here, in this circle, I have an interface. And let's be really strict. And we're going to put this interface in its own DLL and it is DLL number one. And maybe this is my uh, password validation logic, right? So I've got my I uh, user validator, I password validator, whatever it is in here. And I've created my interface. Now, I want to implement that. I want to have some place where the rules are, right? Because this doesn't define the rules. It pretty much just says validate a password. So I come down here. I reference my interface in DLL number two. And I create the code. I say a password must have special characters. A password must have uh, uppercase and lowercase letters, et cetera. That's my implementation. And then I have the code that needs to consume this. And it's in its own DLL also, DLL number three. But it doesn't reference the implementation. It references the interface. What that means is, as long as the interface doesn't change, this code is happy. Okay, The implementation may change. And we get that automatically. It will update the implementation. But if I change my implementation, if I want to add like a rule inside the thing, I don't have to recompile my consumer as long as the interface doesn't change, right? Um, so that's a, like a strict way to take it is to when you really have things in different DLLs, you really get a lot of value out of these things because you don't have to recompile code that doesn't change. But even if you're putting these in the same DLL, even if you're not going that far, you get a lot of value and it's depending upon these abstractions because we might want to change them. We might want to make them different and make them more complicated or less complicated, whatever it is. Let's take a look at an example here. And to do the example here, what are we talking about here? Dependency inversion. To do the example here, we're going to go back to our original and we're going to say, oh, remember that uh, join method that has these single responsibility classes within it? And we're calling these methods. And this sure is single responsibility but it doesn't follow dependency inversion. Why? What am I depending on here? I'm depending on a concrete example. First of all, I've muted it up, but let's not even get into that here. This is a concrete. This is not the I membership validator. This is the membership validator. It's concrete. It's not an abstraction. So what do I want to do? I want to come down here and um, we've got, so now what we do is we create interfaces for each of those, right? We already saw what the classes look like. We had a membership validator. We had a message formatter. We had a notifier. Now we're going to say, let's create I membership validator, I membership service, I message formatter, I notifier, okay, interfaces. And then in our using dependency inversion example here, we have the join method, but you'll notice that these are not concretes anymore. These are, uh, these are abstractions. I've got the I membership validator, the I membership, right? The I message formatter. And I'm using those in the same way. This code isn't really any different. I just took away the new, you know, membership, whatever it is. I took that part away and I'm using these interfaces. That is dependency inversion. Okay. I'm dependent upon an abstraction. Now I'm going to take a minute here because we have a minute, a couple minutes left to show what dependency injection is in case you're wondering. And here we're going to say, I'm going to use dependency injection. What I did is I copied this exact class, right? And all I'm going to do is add a constructor. And in that constructor, I'm going to say, well, wait, where, and because let me go back to the problem here. You might be wondering, where do these things come from? I, this is great, Andy. You've got this validator, 
but it doesn't just magically appear in my code. Dependency injection is a tool that you can use, one tool, there's multiple tools, but dependency injection is a tool that you can use to provide your dependencies. In this case, I'm providing my dependencies by injecting them into my constructor, setting these fields, and then using them. There's more than one way to do dependency injection. There's more than one way to solve for the problem of dependency injection. I'm just showing an example. But I really want to show, I like to show here why dependency inversion and dependency injection are two different things. And with that, <coughs> excuse me, to this slide here, where uh, in case you didn't get a chance to jot down some contact information for me, how to find me, and remind you that if you want to see uh, hour long versions of this, you can go to youtube.com slash the dev talk show and see where we have longer versions of that. And we do have a couple minutes. This is, uh, I got to say here, I'm kind of proud of myself. I'm going to pat myself on the back for saying that I actually got done uh, on time, which is a good thing. But we do have some time in case there's some questions. And uh, if you do have some questions, we can take them now. Uh, I see a comment in here from Jay Wallen. It says, thanks, 20 years experience. Always appreciate a good recap. The core principles, thank you. Have a good overview link on how you implemented your presentation mode with the banner at the bottom. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, to do this, uh, what I've done, and you can see that I've got my, um, my sort of face here, and I've got, let's see, what is it? This is the view that, uh, oh, sorry, that's my, um, I don't see it all the same on my side. I'm using OBS, which is Open Broadcaster Software, I think it's called. Um, and I built a scene, and then OBS has something called Virtual Webcam. And so the web camera that I'm using, the webcam I'm using into Teams, isn't really my webcam that I'm pointing at here, right? It's the output of OBS, right? And OBS allows you to build scenes and put text on and do things like that. And I just thought it would be kind of fun to do for today. It's actually the first time I've done it that way for a presentation like this. Uh, but it's it's the kind of tools we use on the Dev Talk Show and on my own stream and things like that. And I just thought it would be fun for today's presentation. So, uh, Jay, uh, I hope that helps. I don't have a link really on how we did that. But, oh, Mel posted the uh, OBS link, which is great. Thank you, Mel, for posting that link. Um, and if anyone has questions on the solid principles, um, again, we can take those now. We had a really nice sized crowd here, and I appreciate you guys spending your day with me. Hey, it's Meg. Um, I hey, just Meg. wanted to say that I attended all four of the solid principle dev, the dev talk show. I don't know, what, what do you call these? <laughs> Episodes. <laughs> yeah, episodes. And they were, they were really good. And yeah, you did like a really good recap considering it was only 55 minutes. So yeah, um, I definitely recommend it. Thanks, Meg. That's very kind of you. I appreciate you taking a minute to, to, to say that. Thank you. I'm your biggest fan. <laughs> oh, well, you're great. Meg's on the show all the time. She's in the chat. What's great about the Dev Talk Show is that it's not just a presentation. There's three of us talking, sometimes four if we have a guest. And we take, uh, we use the chat really a lot. Like it's hard to follow the chat today. I think honestly it was hard, but with three of us, we, we follow the chat and people ask questions and make suggestions. And it's really not just the presenters talking because we, we admit we don't know the answer to everything. We don't know how to solve everything. And we really rely on the audience. And, and actually Meg is one of those people that is, is quick to jump in and we appreciate her. Thank you, Meg. Andy, question? Yes. Uh, do you have a, uh, a a document, uh, like a standards document that you used for your developers that that describe the, the solid principles? Uh, I, I do have a, a standards document that we use uh, in my organization for our developers, which is pretty long. It's just like always changing. We're always adding more things to it. Uh, we <laughs> Funny you should say, we actually did an episode on this uh, on the Dev Talk Show as well, I think. Um, in that, or in that though, I don't necessarily describe the solid principles. What I say is that uh, in my in my um, in my guidelines that you should follow the solid principles. I think that there are a lot of places where you can find overviews of the solid principles. I didn't think to provide a link in this presentation, 
But I think there's a lot of good places where you can find overviews of the solid principles. And so what I do in my standards and guidelines documents is I refer to other things and I would say you should follow the solid principles. And we, I count that as a bedrock standard in our in our uh, development standards, um, following the solid principles. But I don't go into every one of those things. Like I would say we should use entity framework. But in the in the guidelines, I don't explain entity framework. Right. I, I have all these different things, but that's not I don't think that's always the place to you. Could, it could become a real big Bible really fast. Uh, it might be a good way to do it, uh, but that's not the way I do it. Uh, but we mention it in there. We're very clear about saying you should follow the solid principles. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Yeah.